I've got two unsettling experiences. Both occurred in central North Carolina, USA. I lived in the boonies, so lots of pastures and woodlands. The first one came when I was a young teenager, wrestling with the recent death of a sibling and extraordinarily angry. My home life wasn't stable and I spent a lot of time in the woods when things got bad. I even spent the night outside when I didn't feel safe inside. The forest around my home was essentially a second home and I had no fear wandering around for hours into the dark. After the most violent argument to that date at home, I decided to take off into the woods for the night. I left the house early and went into the woods the angriest I've ever been. I remember I ended up screaming, crying and punching at a tree for a while until it clicked in my head that there was no more sound. North Carolina summers don't exist without the screaming of every kind of insect at all hours of the day. From there, I noticed an encroaching foul odor. I know what dead animals smell like, hello country living, and this was like that, but so much more intense and almost sweet. Dread started to set in as I turned to start walking back home. My instincts were screaming at me to run, so I did. I was a chunky teen and running was not in my wheelhouse, but I was running quickly enough that I crossed the several acres of our property in what felt like seconds. The entire time running up to the crossing and property line, I heard something keeping pace with me from behind. I couldn't see anything from the deck, but I did hear heavy footfalls in the distance. The odor went with them. After that night, I never felt safe in the woods. I never went back into them and if I had to be outside at night, every outdoor light was on and I stayed far from the tree line. The next event occurred roughly five years later, still a teen, less angry and still in the country. I left for college and work one morning and crossed a dead doe in the middle of the road. One that turned onto the road I lived on, less than a quarter mile away, that required I drive partially in the ditch to avoid hitting her. Not an uncommon sight, but I, na I made note of it since I would be coming back at night, and if no one had been tried to move her, I ran the risk of startling and hitting any nighttime scavengers on the road. The day was normal other than an unusually late shift at work, courtesy of surprise inventory. By the time I left, it was nearly 1am and raining. I took my time coming up on where I knew the doe had been and caught some eye shine on my left figured it was a stray animal or a fox taking advantage of an easy meal and glanced in the side view mirror while I passed. It made eye contact with me in the mirror and went from what I'm now certain was a crouch to standing in an instant. And it was tall, I'm dead certain of it. The head looked canine with orange green eye shine, upper body all matted down with rain. It was too dark for me to see much other than that I was driving fast very quickly. That same odour from the previous experience was in my car. The same dread had me taken the turn that took me away from home and into a 40 minute detour. I ended up calling my parents and begging them to turn the outdoor lights on for me and booked it to the door once I was home. I never took that road to or from work after that. I've not encountered that odour again and the woods, especially those around my old home, still feel like they don't want me to be there at best. At worst, that tingle of dread will keep me from venturing too far in. Where I live now, more city than country, what little woodland exists in my immediate area is so thick with homes that any negativity feels weak and muted. I'm not sure what I'm expecting out of sharing this, but I've never told anyone out of fear that I'll be ridiculed for saying some kind of demon chased me in the woods, or I saw what kind of looked like a werewolf chowing down on some roadkill. Just to clarify, I do believe in ghosts, only because I believe I encountered one. I'm a very skeptical person and not one to believe just anything. Also, my sister and grandma saw the exact same figure and I didn't find out till years later. For some context, I was about seven years old, waiting for my mom, my mom to pick me up to take me to school. My mother would drop me off my sister at my different school, zero period, and pick me up to take me to my school. I would usually watch TV and wait for her. 
On this particular morning, I remember I was sitting on her bed and felt like I was being watched. I turned my head out the room and looked into the hallway and saw a black figure of an older man in a sombrero just standing there staring at me. I ran and closed the door till my mother got home. I was so scared, but I didn't tell her anything. The weird part was I knew it wasn't human and it was not a comforting feeling. It was all black, but I could make it that it must have been a short old man with a sombrero. About 18 years later, I was talking to my grandma, who told me she had seen a ghost at th that same apartment twice. She described the guy exactly as I did without knowing my story. Also told me my sister saw him numerous times. That apartment always felt sad and depressing. Everyone who ever came there said they felt uneasy or that it had a horrible vibe to it. My stepdad moved in after two months, wanted us to move out. While my mom never saw anything, she felt like she couldn't move out, even though she wanted to. To this day, I'll never forget what I saw and I believe in ghosts because I trust believe I witnessed one. Also, my grandma said that a lady had just died in that apartment before we moved in, according to the neighbors. Also, I never ever sleep with or even have the door open to my room now. In 2007 and 8, I moved into an apartment in rural Pennsylvania, about 30 minutes outside of Allentown. I got hooked up with it because some friends of the family had been the prior tenants. It was an older two floor house. I lived in the top half and was kind of beat up, but all I could afford as an 18 year old paying for classes at a community college and working. It was great. It was the first time I was truly on my own. I lived there for about a few months with two cats, one I had since I was like three. The first thing I ever noticed, looking back on it anyways, is that the oldest cat would occasionally sit and meow at the same corner of the house. Something she had never really done before. I always thought it was weird, but brushed it off as a cat being a typical weird cat. From time to time, later in the evenings, I would get an uneasy feeling of just being in the apartment. Usually I would just turn on some lights in the hallway or the bedroom at the end of the hall to make myself feel better. Two years went by of living in the apartment and the uneasy feelings occasionally came and went. Often at night as I slept, my TV would make a noise that sounded like someone would flick the side of the plastic with their finger, but I never thought much about it. Now to the chalkboard. The apartment was built around a long hallway with the stairs leading up in the, in the middle, with the kitchen directly across from the stairs. To the right was a small bathroom and at the end of the hall was my bedroom with an attic style closet. To the left was an office with a door that led to the attic and at the end of the left side was my living room. Across the hall from the office and before the living room was a large chalkboard permanently attached to the wall. I had tons of notes on this board related to work and school, phone numbers, tasks to do, names, appointments, you name it. Probably two years worth of notes that were rarely if ever erased because I was a lazy 18 year old. I had everything on that chalkboard written down. One weekend a girl I was dating came home from her college to stay for a few days. I couldn't get off work so we had breakfast and I headed out for the day. To be nice she did some chores and tidying up around my apartment. When I came home from work I came up the stairs and headed into the living room where she was sitting and watching TV. I noticed immediately that around a third of my chalkboard was erased. I was furious and immediately asked her why she would erase my notes, to which she replied, I didn't touch the chalkboard. Well, seeing as the chalkboard was clearly missing information, complete with eraser marks, I asked her how the hell it got like that then. She replied, I don't know. It was a short argument, but I was pretty mad that she was lying to my face. Eventually we got over it and headed out to dinner and a movie. When we returned to the apartment, I noticed that everything was back on the chalkboard. Every note, number, and name was as though it had never been touched. The eraser marks were gone, and it was all in my handwriting. We absolutely freaked out, and she started crying almost immediately, and left to stay with her parents. I called my mother to tell her what had happened, and she was visiting the friends who hooked me up with the apartment and they told me they swore it was haunted while they lived there 
and that their dog would stare at the same corner my cat did. They said they never mentioned it because they knew I would have refused to live there. My last two years of high school, my dad, stepmom, little brother, stepsister and I lived in a house that used to belong to my stepmom's mother and her stepfather. So I had been in this house many, many times throughout my childhood. When I was seven or eight, my sister and I were staying at this house with her grandma on a summer day when my dad and stepmom were at work. I was in the living room watching TV while everyone else was in one of the back bedrooms playing a card game. From where the couch was, you had a clear view of the hallway that led to the three bedrooms and a bathroom. I saw a very tall shadow in the shape of a man saunter down the hallway and into the bedroom across from the one everyone was in. I remember being very scared and ran down the hallway to the room everyone else was in. I never told my family until I was older. Fast forward 10 years later, I'm in high school, now living in this house. My boyfriend and I were in the bedroom watching TV with the door open, because you know, strict parents. The only other person home was my stepmom, who was in her bedroom asleep. My boyfriend casually says, Oh, Jodie, my stepmom, is awake. I said, What? No, she's not. She's asleep in her room. I didn't hear a door open. He looked at me and seemed frightened. He said, No, I literally just watched her walk down the hallway. I was annoyed at this point because I knew she wasn't up. We went down the hall and I opened her door. She was sound asleep. He freaked out and swore someone walked down the hallway. I told him my story about the shadow man I saw in the hallway as a child. And he wanted to leave, he was so scared. We were the only two I know of that saw that. But my dad seemed to have always seen what he believed was the spirit of a little girl in our house. He was watching TV in the living room once and he saw a child's head peek around the edge of the hallway. My baby brother was about five at the time and was in his room asleep. My dad assumed this was my little brother who had gotten out of bed. So he told my little brother to go back to bed and the child disappeared. This happened two more times and after the last time, my dad had had enough. He went back to my brother's room and was shocked to find that he was sound asleep in bed. He wasn't pretending either. My dad double checked. My dad had other experiences with this little girl which seemed to happen in the kitchen while he was cooking. He claims he would see us standing next to him, very close like little kids do if they're being shy. My stepmom was terrified of these types of things and didn't like talking about the paranormal. But one day, with tears in her eyes, she also described this little girl who once even tugged on the bottom of her shirt in the kitchen. My other personal story, it was a weekend and I was up till like 2 a.m. I went to the kitchen for a drink. When I was putting my cup in the sink, I heard a female voice behind me say, hey. I assumed it was my stepmom and said to her, I didn't know you were awake. I turned around to find nobody there. My last story of our creepy house. My sister and her friend were in her bedroom. I heard a crash and then scream. I ran back to her room which was also the one the shadow man went into when I saw when I was a child. They were both wide eyed and scared as hell. They said they were just sitting on her bed and every last knickknack, clock, etc. flew off her nightstand and onto the floor. It was super weird. In 2019, I lived in an old house in a historically working class neighborhood outside of Baltimore. My friend, I only visited him once, we weren't that close, had lived there a year before while going to college and his lease was up, so I'd moved in as it was a cheap option with a few friends. I spent a lot of time alone in this house. I didn't believe in ghosts. I heard creaking that sounded like footsteps from the basements of a lot, but wrote it off as house settling. Things would randomly fall off the pantry, but I had just assumed they were misplaced there. The first night we were there, the basement flooded and became a huge PITA. One night I went to bed and had woken up in the middle of the night and saw a shadow figure whose body was defined, but his facial features were not, standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me. 
I assumed I was in a dream and opened my eyes wider, but realized I was awake. I rolled over and looked back and still saw it. I didn't have any feelings of fear or panic during this time. This occurred one other time. The basement looked creepy. Coming from a small closet consistently smelled of natural gas. The curtains would always fall down from the windows. If you walked in from the back of the house, you would feel as if something was looking over you and following you. Almost as if something was chasing you out. One of my friends later visited me. He claimed that he was sensitive to ghosts. I never really did believe him. We could hear footsteps under us in the basement. He asked if the ghost could show us a sign. The motion activated floodlights from another house turned on and turned off when we asked it to. I reached out to my friend who had previously lived there to ask if he had experienced anything paranormal. I hadn't explained to him what I saw, just that question. He said that in the same room I was in, his roommate woke up to a figure standing over him. Someone who had crashed in the living room also saw it once. He lived in the basement and complained of this thing moving or randomly breaking. Over the course of my roommate living there, he became increasingly irritable, which was unlike him as I had known him my entire life. We were all happy when that lease ended. I grew up in central Indiana in the Nine County region. My parents had kids before they were ready, and it resulted in us not having much money growing up. My parents struggled to make ends meet, and it resulted in my grandparents raising me for large portions of the day, so that my parents could work. My grandparents' home had a storied past. It was built in the mid-1800s, prior to the onset of the Civil War. Supposedly, the first owner was to stop on the Underground Railroad, and this resulted in the house having false walls that opened up to small enclosed areas. It was bizarre and my friends thought it was the coolest thing to have these tiny passages throughout the house. My father actually grew up in the place too. It was a two-story, single-family dwelling with an attic and a basement. Growing up, my father and grandfather would crack jokes about Mr. Cooper. I didn't know anyone by that name, and when asked, my father would always say that the guy was just the previous owner of the home. I didn't think much of it at the time. I just knew that my father wasn't overly fond of the second floor of the home and wouldn't take anything upstairs to the second floor unless the sun was out. Again, I was a child and thought nothing of this as I only stayed on the first floor anyway. My grandparents died when I was a child and left the home to my father because of his financial issues at the time. There were three bedrooms at the top of the stairs with a staircase leading down to the first level. My brother and I were forced to share one of these rooms because the middle room had been completely ver converted into a junk room over time by my grandparents. They were born prior to the onset of the Great Depression and rationing in World War II. As a result, they kept everything and just stored it in this one room. The door was hard to open because of the amount of junk in there and was stacked so densely there wasn't really anywhere to walk. If you've ever seen an episode of Hoarders, that one room looked like that, just without the dead animals and decaying food. My sister had the third bedroom to herself, which we referred to as the blue room because the walls were painted blue. My grandmother seemed to dread that particular room, but I thought nothing of it at the time. My bedroom and the blue room were the locations of the only two false walls I knew about. Both of the closets had a wall that required a minimal amount of force to expose a smaller closet on the other side. Because my grandmother died when I was a child, I never thought to ask why she hated that room. I know why she hated it now. It only took a year to find out. On Christmas Eve in 2001, I was sleeping in the blue room with my brother and sister. The house predated central heating and cooling. Instead, the house had a fireplace that heated the entire house through a network of pipes that fed the smoke through a couple of chimneys. We also depended on window mounted air conditioners to cool the house in each room. These were the same units my grandparents bought with analog dials to set temperature that made a click sound every time you turned it. As such, we tended to congregate into whichever room was cooler or hotter to sleep in. On that particular night, it was the blue room. 
On that night, I was woken up by the bedroom door slipping open and opening slightly. We had pets, and my assumption was that it was one of the animals wanted to warm up too. As I attempted to go to sleep, I heard the air conditioner come on and the clicking of the temperature dials. I sat up to look over at the machine and saw nothing there, just the dials turning back and forth. I yelled for my sister to get up and the dials suddenly stopped turning. At that moment, the door just shut the rest of the way on its own. My brother was still sound asleep, but my sister and I sat there terrified. We had to yell for our parents to turn on the stairway light, which was on the other side of that door, before either of us would leave. Needless to say, I never slept in that room again. Flash forward a couple years to somewhere in 2003 or 4. My dad works his tail off to get a high paying position that results in us doing some renovations to the house, including my bedroom. At that time, the only unusual activity I had heard was footsteps upstairs once in a while, during the night in periods where I felt like I was being watched or I wasn't alone, despite knowing that no one else was there. Because of the renovations, the curtain rods had not yet been installed on my bedroom windows. The only bedroom windows that I had faced the country road that ran just in front of the house, which resulted in any car going by having its headlights flood my bedroom with light. It was late that night and I woke up to a scratching sound coming from the wall behind my bed. The sound was so loud that my brother woke up too. This wasn't especially odd, as we had some vermin get into the walls during the renovations and we're still in the process of getting them out. However, it didn't stop at scratching. What was scratching turned into what sounded like finger tapping on the wall and then full blown knocking. To this day, I believe those sounds came from the hidden room. My brother and I shot up out of bed as soon as we heard that knocking and were grabbing our stuff to leave. At that moment, I immediately got the feeling that we weren't alone again. A passing car suddenly filled the room with light and because of the physics of light coming from a passing car, it basically provided light to the room in stages and then faded out. As the light began to fade, my brother and I saw a dark humanoid figure standing by the window. It didn't have any features at all. I just remember it being a figure and it was gone once all of the light was gone from the room. My brother and I then dashed out of that room screaming. From that point on, we refused to sleep up there at all and slept downstairs in the living room. Quite frankly, I didn't want to go up there for anything anymore. Flash forward again to 2010. I don't go up there for anything beyond clothes and like my father, will only go for so long as the sun is out. The unexplained footsteps still happen once in a while but nothing prepared me for what was going to happen on one particular night. I had already been a couple of years into college at this point and went to an out of state university just to get away from the place. So I was only there for several weeks out of the entire year. My brother was going through some mental health stuff at the time and destroyed the door at the bottom of the staircase leading upstairs by tearing it off of its hinges. My father just left it in the stairwell to fix it later but never got around to the later. I was sleeping on the couch in the downstairs living room where I had been sleeping since that incident in 2004. My brother and sister were out with friends and my parents had gone out on a date night, leaving me alone with the animals. I woke up to my cats hissing at what I assumed was one another, but on closer inspection appeared to be the dining room where that doorway to the staircase was at. Suddenly, I heard a series of footsteps in the junk room directly above the living room where I was. I was caught off guard because, again, there wasn't anywhere to walk in that room. I then heard the creaking of the door leading to that junk room, which again made no sense. The door opens heading into the room and there was so much crap in there that my father couldn't bear to part with after death of his parents that you couldn't open it easily. I was already getting up to head out into the dining room because the front door to the house was there. I had no intention of staying in that place by myself with Mr. Cooper. Suddenly, those footsteps sounded like they were jogging down the stairs to come into the dining room with me. As they got louder, I realized they were getting closer to the ground level and I made a beeline for the front door. Just as I was leaving, I heard the sound of a crash as the broken door 
flew across the room into a curio cabinet that smashed one of its glass walls. The footsteps were so loud, I could hear them darting back up the stairs. I drove away from the area to a department store a few miles away and told my parents to meet me there. I refused to ever be in that home alone. Thankfully, once I got back to college again, my parents informed me that my father had a new job across the country and I wouldn't have to go back. I don't know what Mr. Cooper is, but the house was ultimately torn down. We couldn't sell it because nobody wanted it. The person who ultimately bought it wanted it exclusively for the land and not the structures on it. It was to their benefit. I couldn't imagine putting anyone else through what I saw, and I don't know what my parents would have been forthright over it out of fear. It would scare buyers away. In any case, I'd say that Mr. Cooper got what he wanted because we all left. But he's homeless now. I do have one weird photo. My niece was born to my sister and spent the first year of her life in that house. We have a photo of her sitting in a high chair with something in the frame. I think it's just the hand of the person taking the photo coming into frame and then quickly being moved. But my sister is adamant that my niece wanted out of that chair and she took a photo with both hands. She's also adamant that she sees a face in the upper right of the photo. I'll let you all be the judge of that. For context, the black space behind whatever is in the photo is the staircase leading to the second floor, where all of this activity seemed to originate. The reason you are seeing a black void in place of a door is because this photo was taken nearly six or seven months after that door was tossed completely across the dining room. The door was damaged and was never replaced after the incident. The object directly to my niece's left is the same curio cabinet that was damaged as a result of the door incident. The glass on the side of closest to my niece was damaged from that incident too and never replaced. A couple weeks ago, I received word from my mother while I was on the phone with her that the family friend that the property had been sold to reached out to my father in an attempt to see if he would be interested in repurchasing it. She explained that dad still has an attachment to the property as it was the only thing left to him after his parents died. The rest of his siblings got money and he no longer has it. His siblings have also been rather critical of the fact that the property was demolished and sold despite the fact that none of them ever wanted it over the money. As such, that friend agreed to contact dad first if they had an interest in selling it. To make a long story short, the activities was not appear to have ceased with the demolition of the house. Rather, it has simply moved to the other functional buildings that were on the property. But there were a variety of smaller buildings that dotted the property. They included a chicken house, a garage warehouse, a cattle building, a milk house. I have no idea what the original function of this building was as we never used it. This was the label we gave it. And a partially dilapidated building that sat adjacent to the house. The dilapidated building, as well as the house itself, were demolished completely. The remaining buildings were left standing as this friend intended the property to be used as an additional farm. Since acquiring the property, the friend described four issues to my father that have created their desire to sell. The first is that they are having an issue with lights that are randomly turning off and on thereby driving their electricity bill up as the only thing that even lives on the property is livestock. They got smart and attempted to address the problem by removing light bulbs from the trouble buildings, but found that lights would simply turn on at other properties. The second issue is that the livestock are getting loose without being let out by our family friend. They've installed electric fences, gates, and chain link fencing in an attempt to keep their livestock contained on the property. Unfortunately, the gates are being left open and the animals are simply getting out and running amok. They attempted to address the problem by tying rope to secure the gate, but would just find the knots untied after getting a call about the animals going into the road. The only thing that appears to have lessened is the installation of locks on these gates. The third issue is that they have converted what used to be our garage into a warehouse for holding tractors, other agriculture equipment and a tool workshop. Regardless of time of day, they stated that they have heard footsteps walking on the wooden rafters of the warehouse, as well as hearing knocking sounds on the doors and walls. 
It's gotten to a point where they no longer feel comfortable working there after an incident, in which they left the warehouse to grab some items from their truck and returned to find that the deadbolt had been engaged on the door they'd just walked out of. No one else is there. The final issue is the big one. 911 calls. A couple years ago, they said that they were visited by the county sheriff's office to discuss the fact that 911 calls are pinging out of the property. There's no one on the other end of the line and the calls will just sit there if permitted to. Much like us, they had an issue with break-ins because the property is not actively lived on. So they simply assumed that the only working phone on the property had been triggered somehow after the break-ins. They uninstalled the phone, but the calls are still happening and the problem has gotten serious enough that the county started sending in bills for the bogus calls because the sheriff's office is responding and finding nothing and no one on the property but the animals. Since they service an entire county, they're getting frustrated responding to the considerable distance it takes to get to that location, just to find no issue. The property is effectively a business for them now, and they're eating a loss on their revenue because of the bills associated with these bullshit calls. So I travel a bit for work, and I've stayed in lots of hotels, and I try to stay in hotels that are presumed haunted. The Mender Hotel in San Antonio being my favorite, and in my book, confirmed haunted, but that's a story for another time. So this time, I had a quick in and out job to do some field measurements in Las Vegas, at another hotel lobby, no big deal. However, that hotel I was working on was booked, so the Planet Hollywood wasn't, and it was across the street, plus it was cheap. So I decided to stay there on this trip, at the time, I didn't know anything about the history. No night ghost hunting, no town ghosts, tours, just in and out. The less time I'm in Vegas, all the better. So I check in, go to the room. Nice room, comfortable bed, very clean, COVID and modern. Not my style, but whatever. Overall, I would stay there again. So I settle in, drop stuff and head over to the job site to take measurements. So far, pretty normal and boring. Get done, get dinner, and grab some snacks for the night. Have a very early flight, so no partying, and they have the good stations for movie time. So I'm in the room, sitting watching some Olympics, when I hear what sounds like someone putting the key card in the slot, followed by my trying to handle. Also locks when you close the door, plus I put the dead latch on as well. It moves three times, then stops. I don't hear anything else and go back to watching TV. Figuring someone came to the wrong door very un very commonly. So about 15 minutes go by and I hear the same thing again, but this time a bit harder. And then I hear what I think is whispering outside of the door. Can't hear what they are saying, but I can imagine. They try again, and this time really hard, then nothing. Now it's at that point I'm a bit nervous, but again, not a hell to a rookie. And it happens a lot, so the Olympics is way more important. About another 15 minutes or so go by, and I hear it again, but softer. And almost like they're trying to sneak it open, but it still doesn't open. I also hear whispers, but I can't make it out. This time, I go up to the door to see if I can see out, but no peephole. Then I see the handle move a little back, then up. It does it again, and again it's not moving much, because it's locked, but still enough where I'm a bit weirded out. So this time I yell out, the room's taken, half thinking that I'd get a response of sorry or hey this is our room etc. However, nothing, and at this point I realise I can't hear them leaving. But all day I can hear the footsteps of everyone else walking and talking as they pass by my room. So at that point, I go over to the bed and sit down thinking about the end of that, and either they'll bring a manager and we'll sort it. A couple of hours go by, and now it's late. Not sure about the time, but Big Trouble in Little China is on, so I don't care if the awesome movie deserves my complete attention. Then I hear it again. Key goes in, slot and handle turns. I get mad and rush the door, half expecting some drunk idiots trying to get in the room. And when I open it, nothing. Look both ways down the hall, nothing. However, I can hear whispering, which I walk in that direction and turn the corner and there was nothing there. Now I get that tingle in my spine that I like when I have encounters of weird stuff happen. 
I go back to my room and as I'm in the front of the door, I hear whispers again coming from behind me. I turn and look at nothing. Get inside and close the door and as I walk away from the door, I hear it again. Card and slot and handle turns. Now at this point, I was a bit unnerved. But if the Mengo and Coronado taught me anything, it turned that into some fun. Unfortunately, I didn't have any gear except my cell phone, which isn't really going to help. But I did want to know what the deal was. Jump on the good old lake Google and look it up. Turns out Planet Hollywood used to be the Aladdin. And then something before that. A couple people died here and the more I look, the more I realise that I may be on the side that had a couple deaths as well as some other stuff happened. Well that made this trip a whole lot better. So busted out the cell phone recorder and tried to get the door or whisper either on camera or sound recording which I'll upload if I see or hear anything, if it looks juicy enough to do so. So the door did it a few more times over the night and the whispers keep going throughout the night. And before you say the whispers are other people, there's a very distinct difference between what I was hearing and what it sounds like when the living walk down the hall. Plus you can hear and feel them walking. So the final thing that happened was when I was in bed. Later the wall that separated the bed area from the bathroom sounded like something being dragged across the floor. And then it sounded like the bathroom tube was running. Went into the bathroom and nothing was running. I sat back in the bed and this time it sounded like the bathroom tube was running. Went into the bathroom and nothing was running. I sat back in bed and this time it sounded like it was coming from the wall, not the bathroom. It happened twice and then stopped. And I left the hotel, I felt a little sad. A boring night turned into a hair-raising good time. Oh, and no, it doesn't make Las Vegas any better. However, the hotel was good and the beds were comfortable.